morning. I did want to say one thing before we get started. Um, so to everyone that watches on Facebook, uh, the Facebook app as of next week, uh, the Facebook app that is uh, on the smart TVs and stuff, that will no longer work starting next week. That's our fault. That's Facebook's fault. They, they don't want to do that app anymore. Uh, you can still watch our stream on Facebook. It's just you won't be able to watch it on the app on your smart TV. So if you watch it on your phone, uh, you can even cast it if you know how to do that uh, to your TV. Uh, you should be able to go on the app of the TV. We're looking at other options as far as that goes, but just know that next week, no more Facebook app on your smart TV. So, all right. Um, this morning, we're going to be talking about, well, let me start this off by saying I, I've been getting, I've gotten a couple questions uh, throughout the time of me being a preacher and uh, even before, like I've had these questions as well as uh, how do we see God working in our lives? And this is a common question that people have. Uh, sometimes you're a believer and, and you know, but you just, sometimes you're just like, I, I just don't see God working sometimes, you know? Uh, is, God, is God really doing things for me, right? Or with me? Uh, that, that's, that's a question that, you know, we might all think of at some point or another. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about this morning, how to recognize the Lord working in your life. Because make no mistake, He is always working in your life. And so it's just a matter of us being able to see it, okay? Let's go ahead and pray uh, before we open up Scripture. Dear Lord, uh, I thank you so much for this wonderful church, Lord, and how they've welcomed my family and I. And I, I just pray that uh, that as we open up your word this morning, that you would uh, keep our hearts and our minds open to what you have to teach us and help us stay focused on you, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes to the work that you were doing around us, that, that we would just be able to see the work that you're doing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So there's really three things uh, that we need to be doing uh, in order to see God working in our lives, uh, to make us more aware, right? Uh, first is obviously it's be praying. Uh, second is uh, be looking, right? Then thirdly, be willing, okay? And we're going to go through all of that this morning. So be praying, be looking, be willing, all right? Uh, so the first thing this morning, uh, obviously, is be praying. So if you want to see God working in your life, the very first thing that you have to do is be praying to God. If you're not praying and asking him to do things, you're not going to see it happening. That's, that's flat out, uh, that's, a, that's a biblical truth there. Um, if you want to see, if you want to receive from God, you must ask, right? Uh, the Bible says, ask and ye shall receive, right? Uh, James, when he's rebuking people, he says, uh, you, receive, you, you have not because you ask not. And then when you ask, you ask amiss because uh, he was talking to people that were asking for selfish things. And so we need to be praying. If, every time you, you go throughout the Bible and really when people wanted to see things happening uh, with God, they would be praying. And I don't just mean like a, a simple little prayer. I mean, they were praying hard right? You might say to yourself, well, I pray a lot. Okay, well, do you pray like Daniel did when he was trying to uh, interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream? He prayed all night long, right? Sometimes we go, okay, well, I prayed about it, and that's enough, and I'm going to move on. We need to be begging God. It's okay. The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, right? We need to be really seeking God on things if we want him uh, to, if we want to see him working. And so we have to seek the Lord on things. We have to seek the Lord. That's, that's basically what prayer means, seeking God on things. Um, you know, God knows our needs, right? Uh, we're not praying to him to try to force him to do anything. God wants us to, to understand that we are dependent upon him. That is the purpose of prayer, right? God already knows our hearts knows our needs. Why do we need to say it to him? Because he wants us to show that we are dependent. We have to show faith in those things. We're going to be in uh, the book of Exodus today, and we're going to be going from the end of Exodus chapter 2 to uh, the first half of Exodus chapter 4. And so if you go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 2, 
And I just want to read verse 23 here uh, for a moment. This is the Israelites, and th this is after Moses was exiled from Egypt. Um, and the Israelites, they're facing harsh persecution. Okay, they're facing very harsh persecution. So what do they do? They seek God on this. It says, now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage. And they cried out. And their cry came up to God because of the bondage. And so they were hurting, right? The Bible says they groaned. That's that, that guttural sound, all right? Even it talks about that when, uh, when Lazarus died. What did Jesus do? He, he groaned, right? Uh, that's that's the, that sound that he's making because of the, or sorry, that they were making because of the bondage that they were under. And so they were seeking God because of the things that were happening to them. Their response was to turn to him. And so whenever we're going through troubles and trials in our lives, whenever we want to see something happen, we should be crying out to God. We should be seeking the Lord on those things. We need to understand also that even if we don't see it in the moment, God always hears our prayers. God hears our prayers. The Lord hears us. Verses 24 to 25. Notice that it says, here, So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and God acknowledged them. So the children of Israel had promises from God, right, that they would receive land, right? They, they would receive a promised land, uh, that God was going to be with them. And here, right, God hears their groaning, remembers his covenant with uh, I, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then he looks upon the children of Israel and he acknowledges them. So not only does God just hear our prayers, he acknowledges that we need things. God knows our needs. And so even if we don't see an answer happening immediately to our prayers, understand that God has heard you and he has acknowledged your prayer. What we're going to see here in the next chapter is, you know, obviously the children of Israel, they were still under bondage, but at that same time, God was preparing a man to come and lead them out of bondage, right? So the children of Israel at this point did not know that that was happening, but they're seeking God, and then God's over here working, right? And that's going to be a theme kind of of today. Sometimes we don't see what's off in our peripherals, right, that God's working things, and we're sometimes only focused on what's right in front of us, but God is working us if we're willing to see it. The Lord hears us, right? And so that's, that's, that's the main thing with prayer is we have to be really seeking God on things. And also we need to understand that the Lord hears us, right? You might think this morning, well, you know, if we pray and we repeat things over and over, isn't that vain repetition? And no, no to God and repeating things over and over that we need to God, that's not what it's talking about with vain repetitions. I'll just say that. So taught that scripture talks about vain repetitions uh, when Jesus is teaching them to pray. He's talking like the heathens do, right? And what they would do is when they would repeat things to God, to gods or their gods over and over, uh, Jesus is telling us to not be like that because what they were trying to do was they were trying to control their gods. They were demanding that their gods do something, right? So they repeated over and over again trying to get them to do something. We cannot do that with God. But what we can do is beg the Lord. A very good example of this is when you look at the, the, thief that, the thief on the cross that railed on Jesus, and then you compare that to Peter when he was walking on water. That's very, it's actually a very good comparison because what did the, what did the things that railed on Jesus say? He says, if you're really God, basically, uh, save yourself and us. Demanding that Jesus show some power there and get him off the cross, right? 
That is the wrong response. If you're really God, save yourself and us. But what does Peter do when he's starting to sink, right? He's starting to sink and he cries out to, the, to Jesus, Lord, save me. And so you have one saying, save me, versus the other, save me. You see the difference there, or hear the difference there. One is crying out to the Lord. The other is demanding that he do something. And so we cannot go to the Lord in prayer demanding that God do anything. We can beg, though, and that is proper for us to do. That humility there, that is a good thing. Um, also, when you look at uh, the Samaritan woman that um, was basically begging that Jesus, Jesus help her, right? Uh, he calls her a dog, right? And she said, what does she say to Jesus? Even the dogs get the crumbs from the master's table, right? So when we seek the Lord, we need to do it in humility. That is a good thing to know our place before God. And so if we're on our knees praying all night long or multiple times, seeking the same thing, that's okay. That's what we should be doing, right? It's all about our attitude there. We, it's okay to beg God for things. After prayer, right? So say you're praying about things. And you're, well, I've been praying about this thing all the time, and I still, I still don't see God working. Okay, well, there's something, not something wrong with God. There's something wrong with you in that situation, right? Because the next thing is we have to be looking right? Sometimes we're going through life and we are so absorbed in whatever we're doing that we're not actually, we want God to work, but we're not actually looking for God to work. So we have to be looking. Notice the burning bush, right? In Exodus chapter three. So the, I've heard this preached on multiple times and there's actually one verse here that actually made me write this whole sermon because I never noticed it before. Uh, and it just jumped out to me uh, not that long ago. But we're going to start here with verses 1 and 2. You have to notice the burning bush. Now Moses, it start, start, start with verse 1. Now Moses was taking the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of a burning bush. So he looked, and behold, the bu bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Such an amazing situation that Moses is in. But notice what Moses is doing, right? What's he doing when he starts off this passage? He's tending the flock of Jethro, right? He's leading them uh, to this mountain. So he's doing his job, right? He's going about his life. He's doing his job. Right? It says that the angel of the Lord appeared to him in, in a, a flame of fire in the midst of a bush. Then it says, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. So pay attention to that really quick. So he looked. So uh, what we're going to see in this passage is that initial look, right? That was just kind of a, a peripheral vision, okay? Because when you see the next verse... Uh, that's what it's going to show us. So Moses is doing his business, you know, doing his work, right? And he's going about his life, and then God's like, look at this over here. Look at this over here, right? It's not a loud voice yet. Like, he doesn't call out to Moses, right, yet. But he's got that burning bush over there. Notice the next verse, that Moses turned aside to see what it was. It says in verse 3, then, so after he looked and he saw it, right? It says, then Moses said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. I'm going to repeat that. So you look at the previous sentence, right? It says, so he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight while the bush does not burn. You see the, the, what's happening there? So there's this happening off on the side here, right? And then Moses makes a conscious decision to turn aside and look at it, to go and see it. 
Sometimes God is trying to show us something over off on the side. And sometimes we have to, we, we're, we, we know it's there, but sometimes we would just want to keep on going on our path, what we're doing, right? So God's trying to show us this, and you know, sometimes we don't want to pay attention. But God's trying to get our attention. So what we have to do is make a conscious decision to turn aside and look at it. We have to make a conscious decision that we want to see what God is doing. We have to be looking for it. Notice that also God speaks to us when we are actively looking for Him. God speaks to us when we are actively looking for Him. So, up until this point, God has just shown the burning bush, right? And Moses notices it, then he goes to look at it. The next verse tells us really a lot about the character of God, because remember, God never forces us to do anything. Exodus chapter 3, verse 4, it says, So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. That's the verse that made me want to write this sermon. Because how awesome is that? It says, so the Lord saw that Moses turned aside to look. Moses, God didn't call out to Moses right from the beginning. He showed him this burning bush, right? Then he waited for Moses to notice and go and look at it. Then God calls out to him. Sometimes, you know, you, we're waiting for God to just throw things in our face. And, you know, sometimes we, some people are even looking to hear an audible voice from God. I pray that you don't hear an audible voice from God because uh, you need to get checked out if you do. So, <laughs> but sometimes God is really trying to show us, but he doesn't force us into anything. We have to make a decision to look at it. Then God calls out to Moses. It's like God starts off with a whisper, hey, come look at me. Come, come look and see what I'm doing. Come look and see what I'm doing. Then you go and look and it's like, hey, you made it. Right? You came to the party. I've been doing this thing this whole time. You just now started to notice. That might just be me because, you know, I struggled with going into ministry for a long time. But was, I felt like I, I'm pretty sure God was calling me into ministry a long time before I actually noticed or, you know, made a decision. And then after that, it's like, hey, you know, been trying to tell you this for a while. But it's not just about being called to preach. See, we have to understand that God is trying to get all of our attention. If you're a saved individual, God has something for you to do. You need to notice and look for what that is. If you want to see God working, right, you have to be looking for it. I love it that, that, you know, God waits for him to see. He says, Moses, Moses, right? Moses has to respond, hey, here I am. Okay. That leads to the next point here with looking, right? We have to respond to God. And so the next step there, after God's got our attention, right, we have to respond in the proper way. Exodus chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. It says, so When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush, and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses responds here, Here I am. Then God says, uh, and he said, Draw, or sorry, do not draw near to this place. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. So Moses recognized that this angel of the Lord that was in the burning bush, that this was God. This was God here, right? And what does Moses do? He reacts with utter humility and hides his face, right? That's, that's our response when we see God working. We need to be humble. 
right? Sometimes uh, we pray for things and then those prayers are answered and we think that we did it, right? Sometimes, sometimes everything goes back into shape and we're like, we forget that we ever prayed for that and we're like, well, that's just, you know, that just happened anyway, you know, or, or we did it, right? And sometimes, you know, when, when prayers are answered in our life, we don't, we tend to forget we prayed it in the first place. That's why it's really good to keep a prayer journal if you ever do that. Because then, you know, you write down your prayer and then you go, well, God answered that one. God answered that one. God answered that one, right? Sometimes we think, you even think about the prayers that you say all the time, right? We have to understand that we're not even guaranteed our next breath. And so when we're praying for a blessing on the food and we don't die after we eat, understand that that is a prayer answered, right? That sounds funny, but you think about that. Sometimes we, we, we pray for God to bless our food and, uh, and you know, that happens and we're all good. And we just with your life and forget forget about that or you pray at night before you go to bed and then you wake up the next day and you forget that you even did it or it's just routine and it doesn't really matter to you but understand it matters it does matter we need to be humble and we need to give god credit for every prayer answered the next point here we have to be willing. And so this is up till now, right? You're probably all on board with me. You know, be praying. Okay, got that one. Be looking. Okay, I'm looking for God to work. Next one, be willing. Because if you're praying for something to happen, right? If you're praying for something to happen at our church, and you're like, God, why isn't this happening? Why isn't anyone stepping up to do this? God might just be wanting you to be the one to step up and do it. So be praying, be looking, be willing. God wants to use you. God wants to use you. Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 and actually we're going to read through 10. Uh, but starting at verse 7 here, it says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Remember, the Israelites were praying, right? They were seeking God on this. God is now telling this to Moses. This is pretty cool here. So remember, Israelites, they're not seeing anything happen. But God, somewhere else, he's, he's working a solution for them. So, so I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up uh, from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. And then verse 9, uh, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egypt, sorry, with the with bleh, with which the Egyptians oppress them, uh, come now therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And so they're all praying and everything, and Moses starts to notice God. You know, there he said, see the burning bush and goes aside to look at it. He hears a call from God, and now God wants him to do something. God says, hey, you know, the, the Israelites that are being oppressed, I want you to lead them out. I want you to do this, right? Sometimes there's some stuff that needs to be done that we are aware of, sometimes that other people aren't even aware of that needs to be done. And sometimes we just need to step up and do it because if God is laying it on your heart that that needs to be done then it might be you to be the one to do it. Why should we trust God in these calls, right? When God wants us to do things. Well, we have a lot of promises from God with these things. First, God is with us, right? 
when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he didn't give it and just tell them what to do and then go away. What does he tell them in the Great Commission? What did he tell the disciples? He says, and lo, I am with you always. God's with us, right? So this is the first thing that we need to be aware of in this, that God is with us. So Moses probably had a similar response that we all have when, we're, when we feel like we're being pushed by God to do something. Exodus chapter 3, verses 11 and 12 talks about this. It says, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children out of Egypt? Right? So sometimes I'm not trying, I'm bringing up this one because I'm sure everybody in here has done it. You see someone broken down on the side of the road and you're like, I don't really, I don't have any uh, abilities to fix whatever's wrong with them. What if they just need a phone call or something, you know? Uh, I, mean, I'm, I say this because I've passed people on the side of the road too. So, but we, that, that first thing that we think of always, whenever God is calling us to do something is, who am I to do this? right? I, I'm, I'm not qualified. I'm not anything, right? I have been in this situation. This is part of the reason why I took so long to answer God when I felt that he was calling me into ministry. I can't do that, God. My biggest thing was, you know, uh, I failed public speaking, okay? <laughs> like, how, how am I supposed to get up there and preach? I failed public speaking, right? I, I took it twice, actually. That's a story for another time, but I just could not get up there and talk in front of people. And even to this day, when I'm, uh, when I'm trying to talk about myself, I'll fumble about all over my words and stuff. But when I'm presenting the word of God, it's different. God qualifies the called. He doesn't call the qualified. Okay. So what does God respond to Moses with? So Moses is saying, hey, who am I to do this? Right? God's basically telling Moses, not about you, right? It's about me. Says, so he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. So you're going to go, and it doesn't matter who you are, because I'm the one that's sending you, right? That's what God's saying to Moses. That's it. That's all you need to worry about. Well, as we know, Moses continues to come up with more and more things of why he can't do it, right? The next thing we have to understand in this that can give us comfort when God is telling us to do something, we have to understand it is the I am that sent us. I am sent us. Even when we talk about the New Testament, right? Jesus identifies himself as I am. When they're coming to arrest him, right? They're, they're looking for Jesus. And how does Jesus respond to them when they're asking where, where he is? He says, I am. They all fall back, right? Jesus, make no mistake, Jesus is the I am. So he's telling us to go out and share the gospel. Understand he's not just with us, but this comes with it, the power of I am. He is the one that sent us. So this is what God says to Moses here. It says, then Moses said to God, uh, sorry, verse 13, it says, Indeed, when I am come to the children of Israel and say to him, or sorry, say to them, God of your fathers has sent me to, the, to, sorry, sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? So Moses is like, okay, yeah, you're going to send me. How am I going to prove it to them? Right? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So why should we go out? Because God sent us. The next part of this, I want to go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 4. And we're going to go through verses 1 through 5, but there's a question that God asks Moses here when Moses continues to have excuses. God asks Moses, what is in your hand? 
right? It's that rod that he's holding. Let's go ahead and read verse 1 through 5. It says, Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. Verse 4 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they may, may believe that God, or sorry, that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of, God of Jacob has appeared to you. God asked Moses, what's in your hand? Go back to the beginning of what we're talking about in Exodus chapter 3. What's Moses doing? He's tending the flock of Jethro, right? What did shepherds, what was their most valuable tool? It was the rod, right? Moses is using that rod to, one, uh, guide and correct the sheep when they are starting to go astray. Uh, Moses would use that rod to fend off wolves uh, or predators when they were coming after the sheep. He's climbing up that mountain. He's using that rod to help him climb up the mountain. That rod was Moses' life. He was solely dependent upon that rod. So when God asks him, what's in your hand? It's not just a rod. That's Moses' life that is in his hand. What does God tell him to do? Cast it on the ground. Is calling us to do something. He's telling us to take our life and cast it on the ground before him. Saying, God, it's yours, right? My life is yours. What does God then tell Moses? Or sorry, God turns that rod into a serpent, right? And Moses would then use that rod to show Pharaoh. He would uh, part the Red Sea with it. Uh, he would even, you know, smack a rock twice to make water come out. But understand that that rod had power because of God. So what does God tell Moses to do then? He tells him to pick it back up. So now he's got to take that serpent by the tail and pick it back up, and it becomes a rod again. And, and God tells him that that's what you're going to use to show Pharaoh. All these miracles and stuff that Moses does, have to do with that rod. Why is that so significant? There, God tells Moses to cast his life down, essentially, and then pick it, pick it back up, but yet use it for God. And that is what it, that is what God is calling each one of us to do with our lives: cast it down before Him, and then pick it back up, and use it for Him. Right? Use it to further his kingdom, his glory, right? That's what God wants each one of us to do. But Moses doesn't stop, right? Uh, so even after saying this amazing thing, Moses still has excuses, right? So the next thing we need to do, right, if we really want to see God working, right, and being willing, we need to stop with the excuses, Every one of us, every one of us always has excuses, especially with God, right? I, I feel like we come up with more excuses to God than we do with other people in our lives, right? We need to stop excuses. So first of all, Moses had to understand this, and we have to understand it too. God is more powerful than our inadequacy. So just because we think we're not qualified or we can't do it, understand that God's more powerful than that, right? And in fact, you know, the worse you are when you do things for God, the more it shows God's power, right? Because when people look at you and they, you're doing something that they uh, would have never thought that you could do, you should be like, well, obviously it's not them doing it, it's God, right? It's kind of like, you know, <laughs> I'm going to joke with my grandma. My grandma's probably going to get mad at me later. But she would have never thought that I was going to surrender to ministry, right? And now, 
right? When she sees me doing this, she says, no, that can't be Jack. That's got to be God, <laughs> right? That's the same thing when we're doing anything for God, right? Even the more inadequate we are, the more it shows God's power. So you need to understand that God is bigger than our problems. God wants to use us. He's going to use us. We just have to be willing. Exodus chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. This is Moses talking about, you know, not being an eloquent speaker. And I was like, well, I got a solution for that too, right? It says, then Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent. Neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth, and will teach you what you shall say. Moses is like, hey, I can't talk before people, right? Like, he, he, people believe that he had a stutter, right? Uh, he's not eloquent of speech. He's slow uh, with his tongue, right? That's his, that doesn't matter because it's not about you, remember? It's going to be God. God says, I'll be with your mouth because I created it. Right? God reminds Moses just how small he actually is. It's such an awesome thing. And can you, can you imagine Moses' mindset there? To see your staff that you've held for however many years turn into a serpent, and then you pick it back up and it turns back into a rod, and then you still think to say to God, I still can't do it. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine that? But... Also, how many things has God shown you in your life? And then you still go to God and go, I don't know, God. I, you, I've, I've seen you do this stuff with other people, uh, but not me, right? I, I, I've seen you work great things in the Bible, but eh, eh, not me, right? How often do we do that? At this point, it's just unwillingness. It's not just excuses anymore. It's you are unwilling to serve God if at this point you're not. We have to understand that our unwillingness angers God. It actually makes God angry with us when time after time again, God's telling us, hey, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to help you through this. You're going to, you, I want you to do this and I'm going to be right there with you and it's going to be my power, not yours. And then we still go, God, pick someone else. That makes God angry. Exodus chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. It says, But he said, O my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever, whomever else you may send. Moses says, God, after all of that, right? Moses said, God, send someone else. Right? There's one of the things I skipped over here. Uh, after the rod, God also has Moses stick his hand in his belly, pull it out, and it's leprosy, and then put his hand back in and pull it out again, and it's clean. So God is showing Moses all of the amazing things that he is going to do through him. And Moses is still, he's run out, of, run out of excuses. He says, God, send someone else, anyone else. And it says in verse 14, it says, So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, It's not for Levite, your brother. I know that he can speak well. And look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. It's kind of interesting here. If we tell God at that point, send someone else, don't be upset what God does. That's kind of, you know, oh, uh, something that we need to be aware of. God doesn't have to use you. God can use anyone. God wants you to be part of it. And then we're reluctant to that point. That makes God upset. 
God says something here that a lot of people just kind of brush over. Uh, but God, remember, the attitude of this paragraph here is anger. God's angry with Moses here. So he's telling him to, okay, go to Aaron. Uh, I'm going to be with both of you. It says in verse 16, So he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. Capital G, God. And then it says, And you shall take this rod in your hand with which you shall do the signs. So God is so angry with Moses. He's not complimenting Moses here by saying you'll be like God to him. Remember, Moses was supposed to be the prophet, right? God was going to speak to him, and he was going to speak to the people. That was what God was calling him to do. But Moses was so reluctant that God adds someone else, Aaron, right, to be the spokesperson. And Moses is going to be like God. In other words, Moses was putting himself in the position of God there by being unwilling. You, see, you have all these excuses why you can't do it, right? You're saying, send someone else. You don't want to be the one to speak to people, but, and you don't, you're not trusting God to be with you. So what are you doing when you are so reluctant, when you are making your own decisions and you're not following the Lord? You're putting yourself in the position of God. Say, God, I don't trust you. I know better. That's what God's saying to Moses here. When we don't listen, when we don't want to serve God, that does anger God. Why? Because God gave his only begotten son so that we could be saved. And what does God ask us to do? Most of the time is just tell other people about him. When we can't do that. That angers God. So I'll, in conclusion, as a pianist and song leader come, I'll say this. If you really want to see God working in your life, first of all, you need to be praying, then you need to be looking, and you've got to be willing. So if you want to see God working in your life, you must be willing to work for God. The people that see God working are the ones that are working for Him. You will, you will see God working if you're out serving the people that complain that they don't see God working, oftentimes they're the ones that don't do anything for God. They, they may be saved, but they're not serving. We need to serve God in order to see Him working. Make a decision this morning. If you're saved, to do that with the rest. I don't care if you haven't done this in the past, but make it a point in the rest of your life to serve God. And you, I promise you, you will see Him working. Do that, okay? And if you're here this morning and you're not saved, I pray that you would accept Christ this morning. Uh, it's the easiest thing in the world. All you have to do is repent. That means turning away from your sin and turn, turning towards God, right? Uh, repent, actually, that's, that's what that word means, is to turn around. Make a decision to turn away from your past life and turn toward Christ, and believe in what he did for you on the cross. If you repent and believe, you will be saved. Make a decision to do that this morning.